right. So uh, first of all, good afternoon, one and all. Uh, my name is Ryan Smith, and I'm the Chief External Officer for the Partnership for LA Schools. I will say this, uh, if you did not like the playlist, it was mine, so don't say anything. <laughs> I'm really excited uh, to host uh, this webinar today. Uh, to be truthful, uh, given everything that is um, happening um, across the country um, as we think about not only the pandemic, um, but the uprisings in response to the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. Uh, I thought the conversation that's happening around criminal justice absolutely bears um, a conversation around education as well. Uh, so I've asked some of my, uh, some of the people I think in my head who really understand this issue, people I've worked with, people I've admired, people uh, who have all taught in classrooms um, and still teaching in classrooms, many of them, uh, to have a discussion about what this really means as we think about um, our work moving forward. So this is a sobering time, but this is also an inflection point to think about how we um, support um, anti-racism, um, particularly with the students, families, and communities that we serve. Uh, so I want to give a couple of objectives and do a little bit of housekeeping. So uh, number one, the, the goal here is to really ground ourselves in some of the dialogue that's happening. You know, oftentimes I've said equity is the new coconut water. It's the trend everybody is talking about, but sometimes they're not drinking. Uh, While well, I was having a conversation with a colleague, and now it feels like anti-racism and abolitionist teaching and thinking has become the new kale or equity water. These are very complex constructs that a lot of people um, uh, have thrown out there, but really grounding us on what that means, I think will be really important, particularly as educators. Uh, the other thing is we wanna talk and provide um, policies and practices and tools and beliefs um, for educators and others to combat uh, racism, to combat all the isms that we talk about um, for the students and families that we serve. So this should be a great conversation uh, and I'm excited to get into it. A couple of things as far as housekeeping. Um, one, we, we promote a couple of things. One, a live chat room. So we like to keep our chat rooms lit uh, first of all, I saw people from Georgia, from Arkansas, I think I saw somebody from overseas, a lot of folks from LA, a lot of folks from California, folks from New York. So I expect, um, and in between, so I really expect this to be a really dynamic conversation. Please feel free to use the chat room, uh, the chat uh, monitor to add reflections or anything that you have. If you have questions for the panelists, we're going to wait towards the end, but we do have a Q&A box, towards the, box uh, towards the bottom. So if you can uh, do me a favor and make sure that you're adding your questions in that box, and then anything else you'd like to add, um, use the chat room box. We'll also be adding uh, resources, et cetera, in the chat room box, so please use that uh, and reference that frequently as we uh, begin the conversation. For folks on Twitter, uh, we have... Uh, we have, we're about to uh, add our, the Twitter handles of all the speakers, so you'll see that. Please use that, um, uh, reference the chat box for the Twitter handles. Also, please tag Partnership LA, uh, and then hashtag racial justice and ed, hashtag equity, as we believe these are going to be conversations that come up. Um, and then just a little things on the technical side. So uh, I know this is your first Zoom call. You've not had a Zoom call in the last three months. So all this may be new to you, but let me walk you through it a little bit. Uh, so a couple of things to ensure the best audio and a duration of the meeting. We have muted all the participants except for the speakers. Uh, once again, like to keep the chat box lit. So if you have any um, thoughts, please use that. If you have any questions, use the Q&A box uh, so that we can ensure that the facilitators have your question. Uh, and we have scheduled ample time for Q&A towards the end of the meeting. So please feel free to once again, use that Q&A box um, at any time. A little bit about the partnership who's hosting this conversation today. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that works with LA Unified District to support capacity building, resource equity, educational equity, and advocacy for 19 LAUSD traditional public schools in Boyle Heights, South LA, and Watts. We are not 
a charter management organization, in fact, one of the largest in-district innovation programs in the entire country. And um, I wanna shout out all of the 19 uh, schools that we work with. First, I'm gonna start with Mendez High uh, because uh, I'm a big Jaguars fan and uh, appreciate that we have Emily Grijalva who is representing Mendez um, on the call, but shout out to 20th Street and 49th Street and 99th Street, 107th Street Elementary School, Carver Middle School, Figueroa Street Elementary, Grape Street, Griffith, uh, uh, Griffith Joyner Elementary, Hollenbeck Middle, Huerta Elementary, Jordan High, Markham Middle, uh, our Roosevelt Magnet School, Roosevelt High School, Mendez High, Santee Education Complex, Stevenson Middle, and Sunrise Elementary School. Uh, the educators there are working very hard to support um, our students and families in Watts, Boyle Heights, and South LA, some of my favorite communities. Uh, you guys are my heroes, so I appreciate you. Uh, so the last thing is for the partnership folks, uh, the educators who are joining us from the partnership, uh, you received an email this morning from Tanya Franklin to join a dialogue and action planning session um, around um, a lot of uh, the issues we're talking about, including anti-racism. We really don't want to just be about talk, we want to be about action. So that will happen on Monday at 11 a.m. Um, and uh, please check your inbox in order to join that as well. So we're going to start with a good afternoon and welcome. So uh, as we start, I just want to take a moment to recognize that we are in the moment. Um, we are in a moment where um, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror, that we have to look at our institutions in the mirror, that we absolutely have to speak truth to institutional and structural racism, um, and also have a conversation about what that means for our classrooms and communities. But first, I also want to recognize um, that as humans, we are dealing with a lot, whether it's the pandemic, um, whether it's the images that we see on our screens, whether it's the conversations we're having with our families. So as we kick off, I'm hoping, I'm asking each of our panelists to number one, introduce yourselves um, and uh, your role, and then also share one thing that you've been doing for yourself to take care of yourself during this time. Um, and I will start uh, with Dr. Connie One. Hey folks, uh, how are you? <laughs> I can't really see people's faces, so um, I'm excited to be here. I just wanted to first thank Ryan Smith for bringing us all together and then definitely for having the, thank you to the partnership, um, the whole crew for coordinating. We were just behind the scenes and saw how much work this, um, all of this takes. A little bit about me, I, uh, depending upon who asks, I go by Dr. Connie One, um, and I am the co-founder and executive director of an organization called AAPI Women Lead, which stands for Asian Americans and Pacific Islander Women Lead. We do the work of amplifying the issues of violence that self-identified Asian and Pacific Islander women and girls experience. We also amplify our community's leadership and we do all of this work um, in solidarity with Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color. I am also a uh, community-driven researcher. I uh, have historically, or historically in my career, been brought across the country to help communities do community-driven research. I have worked with organizations like Girls for Gender Equity. Uh, I have worked with organizations like Survived and Punished. Um, and I do work with groups like Pacific Education Group. Um, and my areas of expertise as a researcher and as a scholar happens to be racial and gender violence, school discipline and punishment, as well as the um, carceral continuum. So I do a bunch of work around that. Uh, thank you for asking me and inviting me to join you all. A piece about self-care? Oh, forgot that yeah. question. Self-care. Um, Self-care, you know, I meditate twice a day and I also do yoga. Um, those are my main forms of grounding, I think. Uh, and I've been doing that for a while. And sometimes I'll hit the pads because I love Muay Thai so much. So that's how I take care of things. And I love to say that she started her career um, as a, one thing, as a teacher um, in the Bay Area. So just want to put mm -hmm. that out there. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of amazing teachers, I'm gonna pass the mic to Emily Grijalva, who does amazing work at Mendez High School. Emily. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and be a part of this panel. 
Um, as Ryan mentioned, I am a proud Mendes High School Jaguar. I'm the restorative justice coordinator and community school coordinator. Um, before that, I was an English teacher for 12 years. And um, let's see, as many educators, I wear tons of hats and I'm involved in a lot of things, but some of the, I guess, roles that mean a lot to me. Um, I am part of the successful school, school climate committee for the district. I am part of the alternate for wanding task force. I am part of the uh, LGBTQ resolution task force. So basically um, all of my interests fall under creating safe spaces for students, whether they are youth of color, whether they identify as LGBTQ or allies. Um, I'm just working really hard to make sure that we create love, being and nurturing environments for them. Um, as far as uh, self-care goes, um, nature therapy is really important to me. So I've been trying to go on hikes once a week. And I'm also a runner, shout out to Bull Heights Bridge Runners. Some of them might be um, in the audience, but I also appreciate running um, whenever I get a chance to. So just kind of being in my body and focusing on, you know, the greenery around me just really helps me de-stress. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate you. Um, next, uh, I'm going to hand the mic to Manuel Rustin. Howdy, howdy. My name is Manuel Rustin. I'm a high school history teacher. I teach in John Muir High School, um, at John Muir High School, sorry, in Pasadena. And John Muir High School is the alma mater of Jackie Robinson, uh, Octavia Butler, and, and many others. And it's their spirit and their courage that drives us. It's really a fantastic learning environment. Um, in addition to teaching history there, I'm also the chair of the History Social Science Subject Matter Committee on the Instructional Quality Commission, which is a board that advises the State Board of Education here in California on matters pertaining to frameworks and curricular resources. I'm also on the Educator Advisory Council for EdTrust West so that I can represent mm -hmm. the perspectives of classroom teachers when it comes to those policy decisions. Um, and for self-care lately, well, we adopted a puppy during the quarantine. So we got a quarantine puppy that is bringing me much joy. And in addition to that, I've been streaming a lot of Avatar, The Last Airbender, which is on Netflix. And, um, you know, this world is on fire right now. And that's the story of some kids who are taking out the fire that is uh, engulfing their world and they're doing it with such spirit and love and joy. So it helps me get my mind off of, off of um, current events. All right, and shout out to Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, by the way, if you wanna follow more of Manuel Rustin, uh, please go to all of the above. It's an amazing um, uh, video blog that he does with uh, one of my colleagues, Jeff Garrett, and they interview people from all over education. So shout out to you. Um, speaking of folks in education, I believe Travis, you were on that. Um, you were you were on a, a, right. the the block. So why don't you talk a little bit about who you are? Uh, so uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, so Travis Bristol, uh, I'm a former uh, New York City uh, public schools high school teacher, uh, teacher educator, and former teacher educator with the Boston Teacher Residency Program. Uh, and currently, I am assistant professor at UC Berkeley in the Graduate School of Education. Uh, so some of the ways that I've been practicing um, self-care is I'm, I'm learning and starting to say no. Um, so um, it's not my job to fix the world. I didn't break it. And so I, I am relieving myself of the, of, the, of the responsibility like I need to fix other people's stuff. Um, I'm also um, uh, having... Um, um, you know, uh, routine and nightly dinners with my family. So um, we typically have dinner at about five. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump off this call at about four thirty uh, because that is that is the priority. So those are some of the ways that I've been uh, practicing self care. And lastly, I, I take naps. So I just got up from uh, from about like a two hour nap. Yo, so a couple of things. Naps are worth it. And thank you for not saying no to this panel, as I know you are very busy in demand and appreciate you. Uh, last but certainly not least, I want to pass the mic uh, to Leora Wolf Person, Dr. Uh, Wolf Person. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leora, she, hers. I'm based in Los Angeles, but I am born and raised in San Francisco. So shout out to all the Bay folks that I saw in the chat box. Um, got my teaching credential at Mills College and, uh, and then came down here. 
uh, to LA to do work and study and got to study with Ryan at UCLA um, and uh, have spent a lot of years supporting teachers and principals and creating school systems that are human and rehumanizing uh, the classroom, rehumanizing the hallways, rehumanizing the way that we show up and treat one another. Um, and I'm currently at a women's own consulting firm. We do work in the intersections of mental health, behavioral health, education equity, and racial justice. And um, the current field that I find myself in is the trauma-informed industrial complex and uh, really thinking about um, deeply about the intersections of grief and of grief healing, of crisis recovery and renewal. And the way that I take care of myself is through connection and affirmation. Actually, things like this are a way to regulate, to be able to think, think and feel at the same time. Um, the NAP ministry both the Instagram handle and the Spotify playlist, amazing. Um, and I've been sending a lot of people donuts and flowers through all the things and um, podcasts. And also We're Here and Betty on HBO, both of those two things. So uh, shout out to We're Here and Betty. If you haven't seen those shows, check them out. Leora. Appreciate that, Leora. Um, one thing I will say is we've heard a lot of uh, amazing resources about taking care of yourself. If you'd be willing speakers to share those and for folks who are participating, share how you're taking care of yourself in this moment um, in our chat box as well. So I wanna throw a question to Manuel and Connie. So the past few weeks, we've seen uprisings around the country. And um, in response to a problem that is not new, clearly this is a tipping point, clearly something is different. Clearly, there's a moment that we're having here as folks are having an apologi unapologetic conversations around race, unapologetic conversations around anti-racism, unapologetic conversations about holding each other accountable. So what's different in this moment? And if you will um, speak about, you know, ground us in when we're talking about anti-racism, et cetera, what are we, what are we talking about? Uh, so yes, I hand it to Connie and Manuel. Manuel, you um, want to start it off? Yeah. Connie, you want me to start off? Well, Manuel, why don't, you, why don't you start us off, Manuel, and then Connie. All right, I'll go. Sure. Um, so one thing that makes this different is just the generation. This generation, they're, they're, they're not playing. This generation is one that has been basically raised on demand. Like everything about life experience right now for young people is like on demand. My transportation right now, my food right now, I need everything right now. So when something happens like the, the murder of George Floyd, um, they want justice right now. They're, they're not playing. I mean, they were handed a, war, a world that's, that's burning, that's on fire, and they intend to survive this world. And to survive it, they got to fix it. And they are out there making sure that they are heard and making sure that justice is being served quickly. Um, that's, that's, I think, one of the major differences. And also, unfortunately, um, one thing that contributes to this moment being different is just the fact that um, on the one hand, we had a pandemic and, and one of my students and her reflections during distance learning and during the pandemic, uh, one of her reflections was that as, as tragic as the pandemic has been, she feels that the world really needed a, a timeout, really needed a moment where everybody, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you live, like everything froze. And she said um, that, that, that moment of, of, of stopping everything and really reflecting really has helped her see things differently. And I think that's the case also with the murder of George Floyd. And also, unfortunately, um, you know, we, we've had plenty of examples of folks murdered unarmed on video. And for nearly every single example, there are folks that say, well, what about this? What about that? Well, did he do this? Did he do that? In the George Floyd video, unfortunately, um, it's one of the ones that's almost like a, um, you, you can't say any, there's, there's no question, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that that was cold-blooded murder. Um, so that's a case that I think um, for, for some folks, that was the one that like, okay, I can't think of any more excuses anymore. This is for real, for real. Um, and I think that's, that's all contributed to this moment being bigger and being different than what we've experienced before. Yeah, you know, the one thing I will say, and, you know, as Connie, I always, you know, I think the, the George Floyd uh, video was challenging, but I always thought Philando Castillo would be the tipping point because I just thought that was the most dehumanizing um, video I've ever seen when you can murder somebody in front of their partner and child. But clearly, these images are images that have moved people forward. So Connie, as we think about, th there have been, there've been deaths, particularly at the hands of police um, that have been captured. What would you say about this moment, um, building upon what we heard from Manuel? Um, so I appreciate 
you know, what we are both saying. I think this moment is a, it's a result of a cumulative experiences with violence, right? And so I think for many, it wasn't, it was about George Floyd and it was also about Amy Cooper, right? These happened in the same week, which is where a white woman, you know, weaponizes her tears, her positionality, in order to try to incriminate a black man. And then we see the next day, if, if it is a day, where we see someone who was killed, right? So that kind of, um, those two images in, like, not juxtaposition, but put together, help to set this place on fire. Because, and you also have to think about how these two images happen upon the backdrop of a global pandemic by which Black communities in particular, Indigenous communities, including Native Hawaiians, poor Asian communities, Latinx communities are dying disproportionately from a global pandemic. And we're dying because of uh, health disparities. We're dying because of unaddressed health conditions. So we have these cumulative, like these images, we have a global pandemic where we know our people are dying. Right, and then we have all of these protests from BLM, the deaths that um, sparked these BLM protests. This is the moment where like all of it just blows up because people are tired. Those things on top of all of the organizing that BLM was also built upon, right? So you wanna think about all of the um, black women who led um, a lot of these abolitionist movements starting in the 90s, right? So we're talking about movements and we're talking about violence happening side by side. And here we are today where people are like, it's a wrap. You're gonna, we're gonna die anyways. What do we have to lose, right? So I think that is what makes this moment um, not only different, but uh, a moment we are now imploding. And then we have a president who is um, unapologetic around his white supremacy. So now we also have a symbol for which we can actually say, okay, so now we got a target. And then we also are recognizing that this target or this, you know, person um, was made possible by an entire system, some people who voted him in, right? So we are able to see the cumulative um, outcome of hundreds of years of violence. So that's one. And then before we move forward, I want us to think through when we say anti-racism, I also want us to think through, you know, some of the research that I did on school discipline and, and punishment, when I did work on race and gender and school discipline, the outcome was that there were particular forms of violence that black youth experienced that was different from other youth of color. I say that because anti-racism is different from anti-anti-blackness. And we have to have a conversation about the two because when people and educators are going to work on anti-racist policies and practices, they also have to work on anti-anti-black racist policies and practices as well. The two are happening at the same time and one makes the other possible. Mm. I can, and I can say more about that later so as to not take up too much space. Well, I appreciate that, Connie. And um, it's actually a perfect segue to our next question. So. We're asking um, folks right now um, on the panel, if you could just provide some examples of how do you do this anti-racism work uh, within, your, uh, within your sphere of influence, within your classrooms, within the work that you're doing, um, how can schools advance anti-racism? Connie's point also, think about um, what, what anti-blackness means and, and, and how that um, uh, evolves in communities as well. And I will open it up. I'll actually throw it uh, to Leora first. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Um, yeah, and I think you know the other piece that I'm so grateful for Connie for naming is the legacy that we are that this moment is coming is building off momentum and also is building off intersectional nuance that we have this culture and and a um, and I'm I'm going to speak as a white cis woman that there's a two things that one that there's been a culture of the me too movement which for white women has done a lot of like um platforming with um saying no and and the cancel culture and the second is that a lot of we're coming off of a moment where a lot of white bodies experienced in their perception in our perception uh, limitation and policing during covid for the first time and that that embodied experience of not having choice potentially for the first time might have been a new thing for folks um, to step into. 
So in terms of how we do this work, um, I'm, I just want to be clear, I'm speaking in my position and in the skin that I live in. Um, the work is, <laughs> it's actually, it's a little bit tricky that you had me go first, right? And I'll just name that. <laughs> uh, the work is, is really thinking about what is the place and what is the platform and who am I actually feeling responsible for and accountable to and doing really diligent work. I think, you know, we started with this concept of self-care and the idea of self-care is not escapism. The idea of self-care is doing like really radical and critical interrogation and inquiry around how are we perpetuating and how are we um, profiting off of other people's pain and subjugation. And so in terms of thinking about anti-racism and anti-anti-blackness um, or what it means to be pro-black with a capital B as a white educator um, is, to, is to actually sit in like, what does it mean for me to be white? And what's the legacy of white violence that I carry in me, either literally in me, in my, in my intergenerational nervous system, or in me because of the air that I breathe, because of what it means to become American is actually to be anti-black as a rite of passage. So it's not only for whom am I, but also how am I an actor insidiously and directly perpetuating. And I'll just say one last thing, which is that, you know, if you're feeling like this question is for white folks is why now, right? Why now in this moment? And that's what Ryan opened with. And the piece is, you know, is, is the question of like, who believes in systems who don't believe in them? And the chances for us white educators that if we have believed in systems, it's because the system believed in us and lifted us up. And so part of the question in the same way that we talk about nonprofit culture or school culture is what work are we doing that will eventually step us out of the work <laughs> or, or remove us from our positions of power if we're actually really committed to that um, in that way of abolition. So I'm just going to pause there and see what else comes up, but that's what's at the forefront right now for me. I appreciate that. Um, and what you said about classrooms, I think is really important. And um, I wanted to pass the mic to Emily. Emily, what, what, what are the tangible things that you think we could be doing within schools, within classrooms to combat anti-racism? Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about this movement is that we've been, you know, a lot of the leaders have asked us to really incorporate radical imagination, right? And what is it that we're actually fighting for? Because a lot of times we can kind of focus on the negative, but what is it that we're building? And I think last year's um, teacher strike asked us that too, right? What are the schools that students deserve? And so I think that when we think about what's happening in the schools, um, one of the areas that I you know, really think that we need to um, look and consider and fight is looking at the criminalization of our youth on campus. And so there's been a lot of work done around that, right? Like just trying to end random searches um, and just, you know, making sure that we're providing um, mental health resources, wraparound services, because we know that if there is an increase in mental health services, right, we're talking about like generational trauma, students are facing trauma in their community, in their households, right? How do we make sure that we are being able to provide resources because students cannot really access full learning if they are afraid, right? If they are unsure about, you know, where food's gonna come or rent or, you know, like just everything, or if they're being also exposed to police violence out in their community. And so I think that this um, movement currently is asking us to really hold people accountable. And that's something that I feel very different, right? So for example, restorative justice. You know, the, I was really excited when the district said that they were gonna, you know, really, commit to restorative justice. Okay, so there's that, right? So when we think about values, like, oh yeah, restorative justice sounds great. Like we should be treating our students that way. But then when you look at the budget, right? So last school year, the budget for restorative justice in LUSD was about 10 million. This current school year, it dropped to 2.1. And that's kind of what's being earmarked for next year. And then when you look at the school police budget, it's like 70 million. So that's where the disconnect is, right? Like you can't say you're for restorative justice, you can't say you're for mental health services when you're not funding or adding the resources for it, right? When we're talking about schools that have deteriorating buildings, um, they don't have a full-time nurse, they don't have a full-time counselor, they don't have a full-time librarian, right? Uh, 
foot, like just huge class sizes, lack of technology, right? How are we saying that we're about providing quality education when we're not funding it? So we really need to hold budgets accountable. We really need to hold our elected school officials and the school board accountable, right? Because what they're saying they're prioritizing they're not doing the action to really show that for us to really reach that goal. And so I think that that's extremely important. And so I, I really know that a lot of people are afraid when they hear the idea of defunding the police or disbanding, but we need to think about what $70 million could do for our schools, right? We are constantly facing budget cuts. And so if we're about affirming black lives, black children, right, that need access to like art, sports, technology, right? That's where 70 million could go versus handcuffing a kid in fifth grade. So um, that's where I feel like a lot of our work needs to be, where we can actually reflect like how we're fighting, you know, the criminalization of black lives outside in the city and the community. We should also be fighting it within our school systems. Appreciate that. And that's $70 million that you mentioned is just for the school police of LA Unified, I believe. So I appreciate you um, bringing up that data point. I do want to bring Travis into the discussion. Um, Dr. Bristol, you talk a lot of, you are a teacher diversity expert. In fact, there's not a city that you've gone to where people have not made huge gains thinking about how we think, uh, we think about our pipeline, recruitment and retention of teachers of color differently. How do you think about this in the lens of the work that you do around talent and, um, and as someone who's been in the classroom? Yeah, so I'll just quickly say that um, you asked what's different about this, and I'm still holding my breath to, uh, because I'm not quite, I'm hoping that there is something different about this moment. Um, lots of white children, lots of white elementary school children died in, um, in Newtown, and nothing changed because Americans still love their guns. And more than loving their guns, Americans love white life. And, and um, so I'm holding my breath. Uh, and I'm an eternal optimist. And I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I will continue to, 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 to do work that advances uh, racial equity. And I'm holding my breath because I'm, I'm hoping that something is different about this moment. I think that as it relates to sort of this idea around um, anti-racist sort of teaching or anti-racist policy, I think it's important to, to, to recognize first that um, that this American project was sort of centered on um, the devaluation and the subjugation of people who are not white. Um, and so uh, for me in my work, it, it, I look at how can I decenter whiteness um, and particularly paying attention to disproportionality. So much of my work tries to look at um, the experiences of teachers of color, um, uh, how they come into the profession, what keeps them there and what makes them uh, leave. And so one could, when if, if there clearly there's lots of research that says that teachers of color are leaving at, at a higher rate, you can look and say, uh, well, maybe it's something that unique to the people of color, right, that they are leaving. Um, but much of my work says, what are some of the structural issues um, that are happening in schools that make it challenging for, for folks of color to stay and teach? Um, and that is, you know, being um, a place in the most challenging schools, given the least and expected to do the most. Um, and, and so, for me, I, I think um, someone, I saw someone say something about like looking at or uh, looking at where the, the money is. Uh, and so I think that if, 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 uh, if, our, if our values are um, decentering um, or our values should be right to, to center um, the lives of, of folks at the margins and bring them closer to the center, right? Then that should be where we should be investing our resources um, in, in those types of schools where teachers of color are. Um, to ensure that they have the conditions in which they can teach and their children of color can learn. Can't hear you, Ryan. I got, I got so excited, I just started talking. I just wanna say thank you so much um, for your comments and for folks who are not currently following Dr. Bristol and others, please make sure to follow them, particularly read Dr. Bristol's um, amazing research around diversifying um, the teacher pipeline. Uh, so speaking of people I admire, I want to uh, show a video clip that contextualizes a lot of the themes that we just heard around um, what does it mean when we're talking about whiteness, but also we've often talked about allies 
but, but Dr. Bettina Love, who many of us have read, um, talks about allyship versus co-conspiratorship. So I want to show a clip of her um, talking about what's the difference between allyship and co-conspiratorship, and it's rooted in this conversation that's happening with uprisings and, and literally um, organizing, but also rooted in what happens within classrooms. Um, and by the way, shout out to my colleague, uh, Genevieve, who's on the stage with Bettina Love as she makes her comments. So we're going to bring that up right now. Yeah. And as we start with black women, we know that no movement is is done alone. And so again, thank you for giving us language. Uh, the next question is for both of you. Um, you talk about you make the move from allyship to co-conspiratorship. Mm -hmm. So the question I want you to sit with mm -hmm. is can you identify, once Dr. Love um, gives us a definition, can you identify a co-conspirator that you've had in your work? Mm -hmm. And can you break down for us this difference between an ally <laughs> and a co-conspirator? Yeah, so... Um, I bet you can. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the book is about like this idea of abolitionist teaching, right? And so, um, shout out to Upstate New York. I'm from Upstate New York. Uh, you know, we don't like New Yorkers, but that's okay. Uh, you know, when, you, uh, when you're from Upstate New York, like, where are you from? You know, I'm from, I'm from Upstate. Queens? No. <laughs> Brooklyn? No. Albany? Brooklyn? No. I'm from Upstate New York. Rochester, New York. 90 miles from Canada, right? <laughs> and so, you know, so we had abolitionists yes. in upstate New York. That's where I grew up. And the one thing about an abolitionist, an abolitionist had to be a co-conspirator. Mm. I mean, I want you all for a second to just yeah. think about the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad freed over 100,000 enslaved Africans and black folks. Right? Think about this. There was no Twitter. <laughs> there was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. This was all off trust and love mm. of each other. And to say that this system of racism and bondage, no more. Yeah. We did that. It was everyday people. Farmers, bankers, doctors, teachers, nurses, all ethnicities. We did that as a country. Someone came to your door, gave you a code, you just had to trust them. And so I wanted to bring, I wanted to bring that back. What would it mean for us in 2019 to think about what it would mean to be an abolitionist and to be a co-conspirator? And in the book, I use James Tyson. Mm -hmm. Now, many people are not familiar with who James Tyson is. You know Bree Newsom. Bree Newsom was the young black woman uh, who took that Confederate flag down in South Carolina eight days after Dylan Roof went into the AME church. Mm -hmm. And I tell the story in the book because I think this is an important story because Bree Newsom and James Tyson did not know each other. There were some folks who got together and said, that flag is coming down. They said, and a black woman is going to take it down. They taught Bree how to climb. They had Bree's bell money ready. <laughs> and that morning, Bree Newsom and James Tyson were at an IHOP. They got the word, come take the flag down. Bree Newsom climbs up on the pole to take the flag down. Now, this is where the difference between an ally and a co-conspirator is. James Tyson, now there's a gate for the flagpole. James Tyson isn't standing like outside the gate. Okay, like, Bree, they come and Bree. <laughs> hey, Bree. No, James Tyson, he is inside. And then the police say, you know what? We can get her down. Mm -hmm. Taze the pole. Mm. James Tyson, because he wasn't here, he was here, said, okay. He put his hand on the pole. That white man at that moment understood why he was there. He put his hand on the pole, and he knew that the police would not tase 
that pole with a white man, healthy white man, right there. He saved her life. That's what it means to be an ally. You can stand out there, and allies know all the language, they read all the books, they come to the meeting with all the terms. <laughs> right? They, they read the report before you read the report. <laughs> right? I always say allies make black folks so bad. Like, did you read the new Tallahassee Post book? Like, Damn, why did you read the new Tallahassee Post book? <laughs> like, you know, I've been busy being black. Right? So I didn't read the new Tallahassee Post book, but I know it's fire. <laughs> right? So they come and they know everything and they good. And then after the meeting, you're like, well, what are we going to do? They go, you're like, honey, let's go ready. Where'd they go? <laughs> I'm going to call it over. I'm going to call it over, right? So that's the difference between being an ally and a co-conspirator. You know, and this is that back to that abolitionist. It's to put something on the line for somebody. Mm, yeah. Take a risk to see how to use your whiteness. And I tell, you know, I tell folks all the time, whiteness is like a bank. Hmm. And it just, your ATM card just replenishes itself. Mm. So spend it. <laughs> As the kids say, cash out. <laughs> well, if you didn't hear that last part, she said, whiteness is like an ATM. It just replenishes itself. So spend it. As the kids say, cash out. Um, gotta love Dr. Bettina Love. Um, and if you haven't read her literature, please do. I'm going to throw this question uh, to Connie and to Emily, I um, mean to Leora, what what do you think about when you hear uh, Dr. Bettina Love talk about allyship versus co-conspiratorship, and what do you think that means um, in this moment, and what does that mean for educators as um, we think about how we support students, how we support um, how we support families, and how we support communities? Um, that's a really great question. Ryan. So there are three questions, it sounds like. I'll address the first one. When I think, uh, actually, uh, a couple things. When I think about an abolitionist, I think about John Brown. When I think about not like white abolitionists, right? And what John Brown did was essentially free people. He risked his entire life, you know, and I sent a link. He was, and he, he risked his life and he risked the lives of others in order to set people, to help set people free. I think that's an important example. While I respect the example of like holding a flag, I'm going to need other co-conspirators to put their lives on the, on the line in order to make freedom possible. Not as a metaphor, not as an analogy, you're going to need to use all of your resources and you're going to need yourselves, your bodies included, right? In order to make some fundamental changes. That means you do not um, subscribe to the systems that make this moment possible. That's a big thing to say, right? And I don't make any, I don't, I don't, um, I'm unapologetic about it because I've been an educator and to keep it real, you know, I was in school, I hated school. I had 180, you know, cuts as a, as a high school student. I hated school as a child of Vietnamese refugees. I found it oppressive, repressive and could not stand anything about school. And so I go and get a PhD for I don't know what reason to think that I could somehow make a change, right? And I think a lot of our young people are legitimate when they say they don't wanna be in school. So I think we have to figure out why it is that our young people don't wanna be in school and listen to them. Listen to what it is that is hurting them while they go through the day-to-day -day practices. And some of us were our teachers during No Child Left Behind, which is what I was, and I saw exactly the damage that I was doing to the kids. And I did everything that I could to make sure that I didn't have to teach the curriculum that the state remind, told me I had to. Right? So you have to find creative ways to teach our young people the knowledge that they need in order to be free from the knowledge that the state wants them to have, as opposed to what it is that they really want to learn. You got to be bold enough. Make yourself not just a co-conspirator, make yourself a part of the abolitionist movement. And when we say abolition in this period, people are saying defund prisons, abolish prisons, and make sure all of those resources go to the community not police them, but help them to be free. I appreciate that, Connie. Um, and I will go to Emily. What are your thoughts hearing what Connie just said? Um, so first of all, I did read the latest ta Hisi Codes, but Ryan held a social justice book club, so he chose that book. <laughs> um, but um, I think when I think about the term co-conspirator, like, um, 
also like acknowledging my positionality, right, as a Latinx educator. Um, I think there's been a lot of conversations around the Latinx community about how we can show up and be co-conspirators for uh, Black folks. And I think that one, a lot of it is educating ourselves acknowledging that anti-blackness exists in our community, acknowledging that there are also black Latinx folks, right? And so there's been a lot of like, you know, discussions, um, even criticizing some of the Spanish language media, right? For kind of up, like upholding racist attitudes and really, um, you know, uh, reporting the protests in a negative light. And so there's been a lot of discussions around the Latinx community about how we can make sure that we're not making it about us, right? Um, but also that we're like following and showing up and doing the work. And so um, I think that as a non-Black educator, right, we have to make sure that our curriculum and our instruction um, includes Black history, Black literature. And I also want to make sure that it's not about always the past, right? And I think I saw in the chat, we were talking about, you know, not just making everything trauma-centered, right? But also realizing that one, there is amazing resilient history, um, rich culture, and there's history happening now. Um, so, you know, I'm Guatemalan, and a lot of time Guatemalan history starts from the Civil War. And it was very tragic, it was a genocide, but that's not where Guatemalan history starts. And yet we always focus on the civil war. And there's something about being constantly reminded that you are just a genocide, right? And that's it. Um, and so how do we begin to also bring in other resources that show that there is resiliency, there's brilliance, there was so much more before the civil war and after the civil war. And so I think a lot of that is also the same when we in, we're including or planning our literature is that we're also not just focusing always on the past, uh, in a like a very traumatic, depressing light, you know, but also talking about how it's connected to current movements and how much, you know, change has happened and how much more needs to be done. And I think also as somebody who facilitates youth organizing, I've had to learn how to make sure that it's youth led. Right. And I think that's something hard for teachers a lot of times because we, you know, we decide what we teach and we kind of like are used to being the captain of our classroom. So how do we step back and make sure that we are listening to you, that we are making sure that whatever it is that they want is what you're helping facilitate, right? That you're, that we're putting our hand on the pole for our youth. And so that's also scary, right? Like, uh, you know, I've had my own like GSA club be like, you need to go talk to administrators about this. You need to make sure there's a PD on this. And it's like, yeah, like I, that's my privilege as an adult, right? Educator, I should be doing all of those things. And it makes it sometimes uncomfortable, but that's how I'm showing up for them. So I think that that's kind of like the two ways that I'm seeing it is like, how am I being mindful of my Latinx identity, but also adult, like just being an adult ally to youth. Appreciate that. And hey, Lior, I want you to hold your thought because we're about to lose uh, Dr. Bristol. So I want to get, before we lose you, to go to your wonderful family. Um, and uh, um, I, I do want to know, you know, we're, we're hearing from Emily and other teachers about what can be done. In this moment, what can we be doing tangibly to support the teacher workforce, um, particularly, you know, as uh, you've done amazing research around this issue? So, uh, is, is my am I mute? Okay. Uh, so, if the if the aim of this work is to enact anti-racist teaching, um, it begs the question: um, What sort of requirements are there currently in the state? What supports are there in the state for teachers to unlearn uh, racist ideas? So, if the goal is to enact anti-racist teaching, then 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 how can you help? Um, teachers unlearn racist ideas. I did a quick, I looked at the, the California, uh, um, the, the credentialing, the, you know, the requirements to get a California credential. Uh, there are five, a BA, basic skills test, subject matter competency, US knowledge of the US Constitution, um, and going through a teacher prep program where you learn uh, how to teach reading, um, have advanced uh, computer technology skills and, and, and health. Um, there's, there's no place within um, uh, the requirements to become a credential teacher in California where I see any discussion or any thought around um, engaging in sort of anti-racist uh, teaching. Um, 
we want students to learn ethnic studies, but that presumes that their teachers know how to um, to to design curriculum, right? That that, that brings uh, folks who are at the margins closer to the center. So one concrete thing, this is my my charge to you, Ryan, in your role as a co-chair of the closing the, the achievement gap, uh, is to um, uh, uh, by the by by December. Um, provide some concrete recommendations to the California Teaching uh, Commission in your role as as ta as uh, closing the achievement gap uh, co-chair, um, where teacher prep programs um, can um, uh, can I can there are some concrete re recommendations to teacher prep programs around engaging in anti-racist teaching. Um, we can't expect people to uh, engage in anti-racist teaching if they, are, if they aren't being expected in their teacher prep programs to unlearn racist ideas. And that's something that, that I think that you have the capacity to do, Ryan, um, in your role um, through uh, Tony Thurman's, uh, Superintendent Thurman's office to make some concrete recommendations uh, to, to the state. Thank you, Dr. Bristol. I appreciate that. And just so everyone knows, I do co-chair the Closing the Gap Committee uh, for the state of California, and I know not everyone's in California, um, but I appreciate you holding me accountable um, as we think about um, what we can do for the teacher workforce, and I appreciate all that you're doing. Um, if people need to find you, how can they find you, Travis? Uh, Twitter is the best way. Um, I think that you put in my Twitter handle, right? Absolutely. Or I can put it in, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much, Travis, yeah. for joining us. Really appreciate your thoughts. Yeah. Um, and we're going to take those thoughts into the questions um, portion as well. And if there's specific questions, I'll make sure they DM you on Twitter so that you can follow up with them specifically. So my, my, my email in there as well. All right. So, you know, as we are about to move to question, uh, questions from the audience, I'm going to open this up to the entire panel. So let's get tangible. You know, first of all, we've had over um, 400 folks join us today. So thank you for that. Uh, who've come often on um, from the discussion. I appreciate that. Uh, so here, here, here's the question. What are the tangible things? What are the tangible policies, practices, tools uh, that we can implement in order to dismantle racism and to fight against white supremacy, um, to support communities of color, and to put our students at the heart and center of this conversation. Uh, and I'll open it up uh, to uh, Leora, because I know I left uh, on you as well. So uh, any, any thoughts that you may have? Yeah, um, so I wanna just go back. I'll do a connection piece, but I wanna speak specifically to the white educators that are in this conversation. Um, in terms of what it means, the difference between ally and co-conspirator, and I will say just a couple things. The first is that if you are calling yourself an ally or an activist, the chances are you may need to do some more listening rather than claiming. Um, and so I just want to offer that if other folks are referring to you as that, beautiful. But for me, I think a lot about the embodiment of white supremacy is me needing to be get credit or get claim or get some sort of profit in both like relationship or in capital off of um, being performative or performing. And so I just wanna offer for educators, like do the work that you will not need to get affirmation or acknowledgement for <laughs> and do the work that is the behind the scenes work, do the work that is um, that might make you nauseous and might really feel risky, um, but that's the work. It's not to get a, um, not to get celebration for, and I know that's really hard for some of us on the line, myself included, um, because that's the way that we've been trained. And so the other piece of it is that the co-conspiracy is the root of that is inspire, is this idea of breath and spirit and unity in it. And so what that also does is it asks us, ally as the individual or as the person, to co-conspirator, which is the unified vision, the movement for the people and to see that interdependence. So I'm, I'm just asking uh, and, and really offering as a tangible strategy. I was joking to Ryan earlier that the last three weeks I've been holding a warm crisis line for white educators who really just need to like call someone to either be called in or called out or figure out what that relationship or, or experience feels like. Um, and so I'm gonna ask for you to create space that doesn't involve other people's space, space that doesn't feel and create and perpetuate violence um, for other, for your colleagues, 
Um, and I know we've been talking a lot about our students, but I want to name that for white educators, like it, we, we are 77% of the teacher workforce, 77. And that number hasn't changed since 1890. I mean, really. Um, and so for us, it's like what we, we carry deep um, presence in all the ways. And how do we um, actually decenter ourselves, as has been said, in that our wellness is the standard, or our action is the standard, or our um, work is the standard. Um, and so the last piece is that you asked for strategy. <laughs> it's a tr my answer is just in this moment today, which is that there will be many, many, many moments. And again, I'm speaking directly to the white educators on the line. There will be many, many moments where you won't know the right thing to do. You won't know the right answer. You won't have the right things to say. You're going you're gonna to hurt someone. You're going to harm someone. You'll feel harmed and you'll feel hurt. And part of it is us getting into practice of account, not only responsibility, but accountability. Um, and figuring out like deeply what it means to not have the answer since we have been told in all of our ways that we always have the answers and that our answer is the answer. So what might it look like actually that the strategy is not knowing exactly what to say, but instead um, sitting in the stickiness and the muckiness of this work. Thank you, Leora. I really appreciate that. I appreciate your uh, candor as well. I'm going to go to Manuel, um, as somebody who's in the classroom, somebody who I consider to be a master educator. What would you say in this moment as far as the tangible things um, educators can be doing? Yeah, well, one thing that I will point out is that as a teacher, um, let me tell you, no matter what the standards are, frameworks, uh, campus policies, district policies, when that door closes and it's me and my students, um, I have a lot of power. I have a tremendous amount of power and not every teacher out there, spoiler alert, not every teacher out there is teaching what they're supposed to be teaching or following whatever standards are, are on paper. So one thing, one tangible thing that educators and community partners could do is get involved in those discussions at your local uh, campus about what curriculum is actually being taught. What, what, are the, what are the recent assignments that have been assigned to these students in English or in history or whatever and, and demand accountability for teachers actually addressing these matters because not, until teachers in the classroom actually address anti-blackness specifically, um, it's just going to uh, continue to just be a thing that gets talked about outside, but the ins inside those four, four walls, it'll be business as usual. Just about every district, company, corporation, everybody out there put out a statement about this moment in history. And those statements are, they, they sound great, but they don't really say anything specific. All right. So we see systemic uh, racism uh, pop up in some of those statements, injustice, things like that. And Black Lives Matter has gone from being like a, a fringe risque type of statement to like it was on a NASCAR uh, car yesterday during um, during that race. Um, we need to demand accountability for that. So educators, community members need to show up to board meetings, to whatever's happening and demand accountability. So I saw your statement in, over the summer about how you're going to address injustice. What are you doing? It's been two months. What tangible um, action can you point to that speaks to that? And secondly, I, I saw a lot of comments related to ethnic studies. As chair of the History of Social Science uh, Subject Matter Committee at the uh, Instructional Quality Commission, we are working hard on trying to get an ethnic studies model curriculum out. So another tangible thing that everybody that's watching this can do is send in your public comment and be part of that discussion. Um, we were moving towards having ethnic studies as a statewide graduation requirement. That bill was progressively progressing um, pretty rapidly and then it got stopped in its tracks by the the criticism and outcry around the ethnic studies uh, model curriculum. We need more people who are devoted to anti-blackness, who are devoted to actually teaching about systems of oppression. Um, we need more people to show up and support that model curriculum and, and get that done and get that bill done. Um, you know, so many people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s are suddenly saying like, I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to learn. And they're using systemic uh, racism in their in their day to day now, but not too many can point to what actual systems they're talking about or what systemic racism actually means. So ethnic studies is one way to help um, raise a generation of California students who who know specifically um, how power and privilege presents itself and shows itself. And this is especially important in schools that are predominantly white. I, a lot of times when people talk about the work of anti racism and the work of um, combating anti-blackness. A lot of times, just in, in our heads, we think so-called urban schools, schools with uh, students of color there. But this is really, really important in those schools that are predominantly white because, I mean, 
people of color, we have been fighting this fight for a long time. We've been fighting this fight for 400 years and we cannot just allow it to fall on the shoulders of educators of color, students of color to always be the ones out there fighting this fight. We need those white educators and those predominantly white schools to make sure their students are learning about, about these systems of oppression so that their students could be part of the fight as well. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna open it up for questions now, um, looking at our time. Just wanna make sure that we bring in, uh, continue to bring in the folks uh, who are listening. By the way, I said a, chat, a, a lit chat room. This chat room's on fire, it's not just lit. So please make sure a lot of resources are being shared, a lot of really amazing thoughts as well. I just saw a comment about power and privilege, which is a conversation that we need to continue um, to happen. Um, just a really quick question. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, professional development focused on implicit and explicit bias for staff members? I know there's a lot of conversations happening right now. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of folks are talking about these types of trainings uh, uh, in reaction to this, but even before this moment. So thoughts? Leora, you had a visceral reaction. Would, would you like to say something? Yeah, it's because I get hired all the time to lead them, <laughs> and I it's it's not la it's not funny, but it's funny because most of the time I'm asked to lead PD on implicit bias when it's mainly to silence folks voicing their pain and folks advocating for themselves, and it's used as a tool um, to to suffocate. It's used as a tool to make nice or to um, to band aid. Uh, and so I think the, the piece about implicit bias is that it is an important piece of the fabric of a larger body of work. Um, I'm not negating implicit or explicit bias, but I'm also naming that I think, and someone on the chat, some of my colleagues can help, that the, there was a young man who was actually a facilitator of implicit bias to the police department who ended up getting shot by the police department, right? I'm forgetting the reference, maybe Connie can help. Um, so, you know, in terms of implicit bias, I will just say this, like, if you're doing it, again, the question is why? Why, for whom, by whom, and then what next? And in what context does it sit in? Um, and, and that I will just lead. I can definitely provide more of my critique on implicit bias PD in the chat box, but why, for whom, and in what context? And by whom, for whom, and by whom? Great. Uh, anybody else before I take on the next question? This question's from Jeff Garrett. Would love to hear panelists talk about the challenges we face in trying to do anti-racist teaching and learning in schools when the pressures around accountability is placed on educators and systems leaders uh, tend uh, uh, to spend their focused time on covering standards, et cetera, um, make this difficult. I'll when do we have time that. to do this? Sure. Um, you know, I think that's an excuse that can no longer be accepted anymore, um, especially if we're talking, I, I mean, I'm a high school teacher, so I predominantly think about this through the secondary lens, but um, the standards that we're actually testing for on the SPAC, a lot of them, it doesn't quite matter which area of focus you're focusing on content wise as long as those skills are being developed and those skills could be developed no matter if you're reading this classic novel by a white author or this um, new or groundbreaking novel from from a black woman author so um, the the idea of sticking to the standards can no longer be accepted as an excuse at all um, especially when we're talking about the fact that history social sciences um, ethnic study classes, a lot of other courses don't have a state mandated test tied to them. So as a history teacher, I for sure can park myself in uh, having students examine the Tulsa massacre and make sure I'm still hitting those common core standards related to analyzing evidence and thinking about diverse perspectives. So anybody that's at a school site where a teacher or administrator is saying anything about like, oh, but we got a, you know, standards, test, testing's coming up, this and that, that's a whack excuse. It might've worked back during the No Child Left Behind era where it was like this, you know, content-based content test, but that's not the case anymore. That, that excuse is outdated. We cannot stand for that anymore. Thank you for that. Uh, this question comes from Ty. Oh, please. Yeah, please. Emily, please. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Manuel, especially as an English teacher. I feel like especially the common core standards were more about like critical literacy skills. So definitely what kind of text you uh, use can be pretty flexible. Um, 
But I also wanted to remind folks that because of the quarantine, right, all schools are kind of in a place of like, what will next school year look like? And so I really, you know, invite educators to be in those conversations, right, because this is your opportunity to decide, one, like what kind of PD is needed as you move forward, right, just like how, what needs we're going to be, um, you know, servicing, uh, what kind of needs assessment, how we can address what is happening now. And so I think that, if anything, this pandemic gave us a chance to be like, oh, schools can be done differently. So that also includes content, PD, and just like what we need to know to start strong and to support our students. So I definitely invite educators to join those conversations and don't let those decisions be done without you. Thank you. Um, speaking, uh, Connie, are you speaking because you're on mute? Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I just wanted to say I wanted to echo both of the points. Um, we don't we should not be. I, I mean, I, I know that people are feeling constrained by the quote unquote standards, but you have to be bold enough to actually teach differently and be differently. And I talk to different educators still today, who even when they're trying to teach the texts that are required, they infuse a critical analysis. They'll say, they'll read, they'll, they'll teach from a textbook and then they'll say, they'll teach the kids, is this fact or is this, you know, um, made up by white standards? And the kids will now be able to reiterate, right? And these are third graders who now are like, that's not true. They may, you know, they have a critique of these things. So you get to teach both. You get to teach people how, like young people, how to be critical of even the standards they're being required to learn from as well right so i think that's really really important and i think it's important for you to join groups and learn from educators of color including folks like teachers for social justice right um we're there there are teachers everywhere doing this work um and you get to just learn from them it's you're not creating something new educators have been doing this for decades upon decades you just gotta find them um and manuel seems to be one right here emily's right here you know i mean and then there's a person named um under the name of uh, Elaine Columba, it's actually Arnell. He's teaching at a local district. You guys are all writing these things. You should write each other's names down and find each other. By the way, we should definitely, because there's been so much amazing things that have been shared, we'll try to pull out all the resources and share them mm -hmm. back to all the participants so that you'll have them uh, moving forward to Connie's mm -hmm. point. Um, I have a question from Keith Hardeen. Uh, what does systemic racism mean? And should we replace all progressive policies that are presently running every institution of our country with different policies and what would they be? Small question. But let's start with the beginning. What does systemic racism mean when we talk about systemic institutional racism? Who'd like to take a stab? I will I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so obviously, that's a really big question, really big question that um, I'm not in any way going to be able to cover it comprehensively. But a lot of times when people think about racism, they think about overt racism, like racial slurs, um, somebody specifically not hiring somebody because of their skin color. And systemic racism is racism that's so baked into our, our, our institutions and our daily systems that it's not necessarily one racist person that makes this decision, but it's actually like a policy. So for example, the school that I teach teacher is in the northwest corner of Pasadena and way back in the 30s that's a, a that was a wet, red line neighborhood so folks mm -hmm. who were in that area um, weren't entitled to the same type of support mm -hmm. and FHA loans as folks in other parts of Pasadena so they weren't able to capitalize on their homes mm -hmm. as investments and build wealth and mm -hmm. pass that wealth down generationally so that corner this is 2020 and that corner is still the lower income corner of Pasadena that corner is still the primarily black and brown corner of Pasadena and it's been almost a hundred years but just the just the banking financing real estate uh, systems, the way they uh, discriminated against black and brown folks way back when is still passed down generation by generation. There's so many other examples. Um, you could look at uh, sentencing laws, somebody who's uh, caught with a particular type of drug and somebody else who has nearly the same thing, but the sentencing laws being different and one type of drug being primarily one used among black folks. Like there's just so much there, but we're talking about racism that's so baked into the systems that it's not necessarily somebody who like you know, goes out at night with the Klan hood making these decisions. I mean, sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's just something that's been there for so long, nobody even uh, recognizes it. It's so natural, it's so American. You know, one thing just to add on to that that I thought about is a lot of people think of um, racism as Amy Cooper calling the police, which is clearly um, a, a sign of that. But, you know, 
another illustration would be the la you know, particularly because we're talking about COVID, the lack of um, Black and Latinx and low-income folks who could at once get a test, but we're seeing that a tiger is being tested in the New York Zoo, right? So clearly our systems are uh, reversed and who has access, who is supported, who has, who is um, able to have life um, and, and who is okay to die. Um, Connie, is there anything that you want to add there? So I think about uh, one of my mentors' definitions of racism, where she says racism specifically is the state-sanctioned, um, hold on, state-sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So Professor Ruthie Gilmer talks about racism having everything to do with systematic approaches towards um, premature death for particular populations. So if that's an overall definition of racism, systemically, kind of a, the structure that we live under, I have a colleague and mentor named Frank Wilderson who talks about anti-Blackness in particular as the air we breathe, right? If these are our definitions of racism and anti-Blackness, then we have to think about the institutions that support these, these, um, these systems, right? And that are informed by these systems. So if we think about the institutions, then we think about healthcare, prisons, policing, the entire criminal justice system, education, right? They're informed by these systems and structures and they make these systems and structures possible. And then we have our interpersonal levels, which is the ways we relate to each other and the ways we teach in class and the ways we regard our, co our colleagues and our students, for instance. Those are interpersonal forms of um, relating that are informed by the institutions, that inform the institutions, and they make the systems and structures possible. These systems and structures are not possible without the individuals upholding them. So I want us to kind of hold that as our understanding of um, systems and how they play out and how we're pretty much implicated unless we're actively resisting all of it. I hope yes, we are. Yes, yeah, thank you, Connie. Yeah, I just, mm -hmm. he, yeah I, I'm getting, like, Connie, I hope you felt my, like, verb in the body, body <laughs> movement. Um, the piece that I want to name is actually back to how we started this conversation, which is, Ryan, your acknowledgement of like how violent did a death need to be for us to show collective interest and that idea that we are in not only having um, engaging in oppression war, but in um, death, death war and how and I'm, and I'm speaking to now, obviously, to us in the context of education, that there are many times that I often hear that that student had it coming to him or it was gonna happen anyway. I'm not gonna invest my time in that kid because he's run up in X, Y, Z. So I just want us to offer that, yes, we're, we're seeing it at a national, in a national space around like at literally whose life matters and what specifically black bodies need to do in order to deserve our attention. But that really applies to the young people that we are in space with um, and the young people that we teach and serve. Um, so I just want to like, again, like it is in everything. It's in how we talk, whose, whose students do we, which students do we invest in? Because we are already preparing ourselves for behavior that's going to deem them like they had it coming to them. Um, and, uh, and the last sentence I'll say is that in the last two weeks, I've been in so many conversations with white educators, white social workers, white mental health practitioners who have said things like, well, he was either a martyr or but look what he did or he was a father, he didn't deserve it, or, and I just wanna like cut that and just name, like <laughs> that, that, that piece is us perpetuating white supremacy and understanding that white bodies when they die are the supreme um, standard of care. And so I'll just, I'll stop there because I'm seeing Connie wanting to say something, but it really relates to how we understand our students' lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just to kind of um, piggyback a little bit uh, on that, um, I think about when I was both doing my research, you know, I was studying school discipline, and at the time what we saw, or, and it still exists, was, you know, there was a disproportionate and overrepresentation of Black and Latinx students in the discipline data, still exists today, 
right? We see them in suspensions, expulsions. But what we did not register were the informal types of discipline and punishment that happens much more regularly than the suspensions and the expulsions, much more regularly. And that, that looks like sending a kid outside, right? And keeping them out there for an hour. That looks like when they ask for help and you're not helping them, right? It looks like, you know, um, humiliating the child in class. None of that registers as discipline policies, right? We aren't quantifying those moments for the kids who's told she can't, you know, she's talking too much in class, so she shuts down for the entire period, if not the school year, right? We too often discounted the types of um, violence that we commit in our classrooms against our young people, either by neglecting them, humiliating them, and or just um, punishing them. I also want us to think the way that we address that perhaps is one recognizing the context by which our young people are living under, right? A lot of my young people are, you know, surrogate parents helping their parents who are working, you know, constant hours to take care of their kids, right? There's that. It's also about recognizing our own privileges and our own power. So I, I just think we have to think through how systemic racism plays out inside of the classroom in ways that are silent and painful, if not deadly. All right. We started this conversation um, really centered on anti-anti-Blackness or what Leora said, pro-Blackness with a capital B um, and anti-racism. So we have a question um, from Mark, who asked, what are the ways that we can empower Black alumni, POC alumni, to demand accountability from our alma maters, districts, and public office members? As we think about action, how can we demand um, accountability collectively? And I'll ask you to be brief, um, as we don't have much time, so give me one thought. Um, one quick thought is schools have to open up their doors to the community. I mean, so many schools are just turn their back to the community. And if your community member feels really uh, challenging and difficult to like actually get on campus and speak with someone, schools got to stop that. Schools got to uh, be out there in community. Uh, teachers, administrators, all of them, they got to be at community events. They got to be there, be present so that folks can be heard. That's one concrete. Thank you. And I will just add to that black and Latinx family uh, parents are not the enemy. They are partners in supporting their children. Um, and, and we'll have to realize that in order to change the systems that we serve. Emily. No. <laughs> um, thank you for saying that, um, Ryan. I think that that's probably like one of my biggest pet peeves is when people try to like blame parents. Um, and um, I don't know, especially being the daughter of an immigrant who didn't get to finish elementary school, right? Like my mom cared so much about my education. She just couldn't help me with it at home, but by no means does that mean that she didn't care. And so a lot of times I feel like, you know, one, parent engagement is huge. We need to make sure that our schools feel open and that there's workshops and there's just like, and also at different times of the day, because our parents, you know, schedule is very different. So how are we making sure that, like Manuel said, like our schools open and people are, feel welcomed in our school environment? I also want to say like, just personally, like our school is, you know, like 98% Latin next um and then our like workforce kind of looks like that too and so i think that also we have to be accountable and make sure that we're reaching out to like our black colleagues our few black students and making sure that you know that we're also like trying to make sure that they're not kind of falling behind because i have had you know very few black colleagues feel like this is very like Latinx centered, where do I fit in here? And so we don't wanna make sure that we, they feel isolated and like they can't, you know, like they're not being included in our school culture. And so I think that that's another way that we can also help with that is making sure that our black colleagues and black students feel welcome on campus, even if they're like the very few minority. And I appreciate you because I think I walked into one of your lessons where you were talking about the importance of Bayard Rustin, or you're talking to LGBTQ students about the importance of his legacy um, in a predominantly Latinx environment. And I just said, you know, thank you for that, because I saw myself in that conversation. I appreciate that. Um, any other thoughts here, tangible things that we can be doing? Can I just say um, two things? One is you want to create a condition in the classroom, in the school, that welcomes our young people and their families. It's create the conditions. Be, be open, be warm. These are partnerships, but it's also families. You wouldn't talk to your family 
in a disrespectful way. Don't, don't do that to anybody else. It's just one-on-one, -on -one, right? So that's one thing. And then work to, to make systemic changes, demand more resources, demand professional development for your teachers, admin that are racially, you know, that have not racial sensitivity, but have some type of anti-racist training development in it, right? So it's both and. It's relate to people with humility, and then it's also demand and advocate and work for change. Thank you. Leora? Did I lose you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just, I think we can move into the next, I'm watching time and want to watch my voice. Great, 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 great. <laughs> Well, well, speaking of that, first of all, speaking of voice, um, we have come towards the end. I, first of all, if you could put in the chat how much you appreciate the speakers and provide gratitude, not only for the speakers who were on the panel, but for the voices that we had in the chat. Um, it feels like we should have another conversation. So if you're about us creating more space for these folks, um, it's, a, it's impressive. And we will have this available. We will send you the link to send to your colleagues. Um, one thing I will say is that um, the reason why I wanted to host this is because you know, I, I knew that the words of the folks who I care about would be, would be whole, um, particularly for others. And let me tell you, Man, you know, Manuel and Emily and Connie and Travis and Leora, you really spoke truth to power. Um, you spoke truth to my life today. Um, in a hard, hard time, this is the way that I'm trying to create space to change some things. So thank you. Thank you for me personally. This was selfish because I got to hear wonderful people, um, but I also got to share it. We never dipped under 300 folks, y'all. We got to 400 and clearly people were there for the entire hour and a half. Thank you so much to folks who came from across the country, across California, across Los Angeles. Um, I appreciate you. Um, please follow us at, at Partnership LA. I'm Ryan Smith ED because I'm a provide. I'm at Ryan Smith Ed because I'm gonna provide more opportunities like that. So make sure to follow all of us. Um, and thank you to my partnership staff members, um, Nell and Gracie and Claudia. Uh, and I cannot forget Nell, Gracie, Claudia, and I am not gonna forget Stephanie, who are the folks who actually put this together. Um, I'm in, I'm inspired by. Uh, the wonderful folks I get to work with, but particularly for the women I get to work with. So thank you for holding us down. And I appreciate y'all. You guys take care. We're gonna have some music. Oh, there's an exit ticket. So do not, we're gonna put the exit ticket right now in the chat. Please, if you wanna do this again, I need some, I actually need some reflection in order to show this was successful in order to make sure we do it again. So can you please fill out the exit ticket, please? Cause you know, you didn't have to pay for this, but that evaluation is the way that I can make sure to tell my colleagues this was well worth it. So um, thank you so much. Fill out that exit ticket. Um, we'll send the link. And then um, DJ Nail on the ones and twos uh, and the wheels are still, if you could uh, end us and close us out with some music as people go. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Leora. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate you all so, so much. Um, and until we see each other next time, be safe um, and continue to uh, challenge that we're in.